I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. to see so many uh, pastors here. Uh, as Chris pointed out, the situation um, with the uh, secular media isn't very pretty. Uh, and I don't know if you've noticed, but there is this little situation with Islam in the world. And uh, uh, I think it comes down to the church. I think it's going to come down uh, to the church um, to do anything uh, with Muslims and with Islam. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very glad to see Christian leaders taking an interest in this because uh, I do think the, the situation with Islam stands or falls uh, with the church. Um, I became interested in Islam, well, actually I started studying Islam before I started studying Christianity. Uh, I grew up as an atheist, started studying Islam first, later uh, started studying Christianity mostly to refute a Christian who was annoying me, um, became a Christian. And then uh, in college, uh, I was on the uh, speech and debate team, and I ended up sharing a hotel room with uh, a Muslim who was on the debate team. And uh, so we shared a hotel room on a school trip. I was um, sitting on my bed that evening reading the Bible, and uh, I prayed. Well, I don't know if it was a coincidence that I ended up in the room with uh, a Muslim here, uh, but I'm horrible at starting up conversations, so Lord, uh, if you want me to talk to this guy, you know, it'd be good if he started the conversation. And about 60 seconds later, he turns to me and says, so, are you a hardcore Christian? And, uh, and I said, yes, and it was, uh, it was World War III after that. Um, so that was, uh, that's Nabil Qureshi, he's my ministry partner now. Uh, Nabil um, eventually became uh, a Christian, at which point I thought, aha, I'm finally done with Islam uh, because I was more interested. I've always been more interested in dealing with uh, the the arguments of atheists because that's that, that was my background. Um, so my best friend, uh, one of the only Muslims I knew, was now a Christian. I could return to atheism, um, not literally return to it, but return to uh, dealing with it. And then something interesting happened. Uh, the entire Muslim world declared war on Nabil. Uh, his family. Uh, his community started getting death threats. He started getting death threats without, within about a month, and he wasn't even telling anyone that he was a Muslim. I mean, that, that he had left Islam. Uh, so, I mean, and when I say death, I don't mean email. I mean left on his car. You're dead. Uh, we know where you are. Uh, so, all of a sudden, I have to continue uh, dealing with Islam, uh, mostly because people started challenging us to uh, public debates. Hey, if you think you have good reasons for becoming a Christian, why don't you come out here? Uh, and defend it at such and such school or you know such and such mosque. And the Bill and I now, uh, over the past several years, have done um, somewhere between 35 and 40 uh, public debates um, that tend to go pretty well. Uh, so that's why I became uh, interested in Islam, and now uh, I find that I can never get away with it because it's uh, get away from it because it's always uh, such an issue in the world and. I and mean, let's face it, there is a religion out there that calls for the horrible, bloody death of my best friend. Uh, so, I have, uh, have to pay attention to what that religion teaches. Now, there are tons of things that are important for uh, Christians to know about Islam, basic uh, Muslim beliefs, what they believe about the Quran and the Hadith and uh, Muhammad and everything else. Um, but we don't have too long, so I'm going to focus on uh, the few key things that I think uh, the pastors need to know, that, that, that Christian leaders um, need to know um, from my experience in dealing uh, with Islam over the years. Uh, several important things that uh, Westerners need to know and uh, uh, especially Christians in the West need to know. Uh, so we'll look at five things. Uh, Islam and the Gospel. We'll just look at this briefly of why this should be an especially interesting topic to Christians. Uh, what Islam has to say about the Bible. You know, if, if, if Christians would get down point number two here and learn what Islam says about the Bible. I think, it would change, I think it would change Christian-Muslim interaction in the world today. Uh, we'll look at three stages of jihad. Uh, 
spend a moment on the doctrine of Takiyah, because it's important to know um, what's going on there. And uh, finally, we'll uh, finish briefly with uh, Muhammad. Uh, we won't talk long about Muhammad. I just want to give you uh, quick highlights, because lots of people say things about Muhammad, and Muslims say, thing about, say things about Muhammad, and critics of Islam say things about Muhammad. Uh, if you don't know what the historical sources actually say, I'm just going to give you a brief outline of what's fact and what's fiction here. Uh, so, Islam and the Gospel. This should be central to, to, uh, to Christians. Uh, you know verses like this, every one of you does. Uh, so beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. False prophets will arise and will mislead many. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach you a gospel contrary to what you have received, um, let it be eternally condemned. Um, so, over and over again uh, in the Bible we're told, here's the gospel. And, by the way, false prophets and false teachers are coming to try and do something about that gospel, to try and change it and alter it in some way. So if you're a Christian, you should be expecting people to come along with, uh, with new gospels, with false gospels. And uh, Islam, I would say, is, is the most interesting case of this uh, that I've ever seen. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, I mean, it, really, it's amazing. I mean, think about this. According to Islam, Jesus was born of a virgin. Who agrees with us that Jesus was born of a virgin? Atheists don't agree with us. I mean, no one agrees with us that Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus performed many miracles. In fact, according to Islam, Jesus lived the most miraculous life in history. Who agrees with us on that? No one agrees with us, except Muslims. Uh, and Jesus is even the Messiah, according to Islam. Islam affirms all of these Christian doctrines that no one else uh, seems to agree with us on. So you look at that and say, wow, they're on the same page. And then you, uh, you turn and look a little deeper, and you find out there's only a couple things that Muslims disagree with us on. Uh, one, Jesus was not divine. Uh, two, he didn't die on the cross. And three, he didn't rise from the dead. Now, why is this important? Well, the gospel, if you go back to the book of Acts, the core of the Christian gospel always centered around Jesus' identity as Lord, uh, his sacrificial death on the cross, and his resurrection from the dead. Over and over in the book of Acts, whenever they preach, they might preach all kinds of things, but they always return to those three doctrines. So we can look at that and say, this is the core of the Christian gospel, Jesus' sacrificial death, his resurrection from the dead, his divine nature. And Muhammad comes along in the 7th century and says, you Christians, you believe in God? You believe in one God? I do too. We don't agree with those pagans. You believe Jesus was born of a virgin? I do too. You believe Jesus lived the most miraculous life in history? I do too. You believe Jesus was the Messiah? I do too. There are just these three little things that we can't agree on. Um, Jesus didn't die on the cross, didn't rise from the dead, never claimed, never claimed to be divine. Now, if we can just get past those... Um, we'll be in full agreement here. Now, as a Christian, you, you know, this should set some alarms off. Well, wait a minute, this is exactly what I would expect. Someone who, this is exactly what I would expect of a false prophet. Someone who comes along, agrees with us on everything except the core of the Christian gospel. So, this shouldn't be surprising uh, to Christians, but what I find, and this is the point, this is the point that if Christians can get down, it'll change everything. Muslims can't be consistent and deny these three doctrines. They can't do it. It's impossible. If a Muslim denies these doctrines, as he's commanded to do, he's just contradicted uh, some other things the Quran says. So, let's take a look. Um, probably the most important, if you, if you want to get one thing down, uh, if Christians in general get these couple of points uh, down, these couple of verses down, a few minutes worth of work, um, the world would change. Now watch. This is Allah talking to Jesus. Surah 355, Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. Then shall ye all return unto me, and I will judge between you uh, of the matters wherein you dispute. Notice, Allah promises Jesus, I will make those who follow you superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. How long are the true followers of Jesus going to be victorious? till the day of resurrection. Very important because most Muslims will tell you Christianity was immediately corrupted by the Apostle Paul. Well, why did Allah say Christians are going to be true followers of Jesus were going to be victorious until the day of resurrection? Keep paying it, pay attention. Watch this. Surah 6114. O you who believe, be helpers in the cause of Allah. As Jesus, son of Mary, said to his disciples, who are my helpers in the cause of Allah? 
The disciples said, we are helpers in the cause of Allah. So this is Jesus' followers proclaiming um, their belief. So a party of the children of Israel believed and another party disbelieved. Then we aided those who believed against their enemy and they became uppermost. Who became uppermost according to the Quran of the followers of Jesus? The true followers of Jesus were the ones who were aided by God who ultimately became uppermost. And it's interesting if you open up a Quran, uh, the most popular Quran here in the West is the Yusuf Ali translation. If you look up his study note um, on this verse, he says, the only thing this can refer to is uh, when Christianity took over the Roman Empire. That's the only time Christians were uppermost over anyone. So he applies this to the Roman Empire. Wait a minute. Those were the Christians Allah helped. The Christianity that took over the Roman Empire proclaimed Jesus' sacrificial death, his resurrection from the dead, and his divine nature. Now, uh, Allah is going to make the true followers of Jesus victorious, and he aided the true Christians until they became uppermost, and Muslim commentaries will say, this means the Roman Empire. So the Christians that, that took over the Roman Empire were the ones who were aided by Allah. Now you've got a problem, because we know what that Christianity taught, and it didn't teach Jesus was just a prophet didn't teach that. So why is Allah helping these Christians who are supposedly the true Christians and they're proclaiming a message that contradicts Islam? Uh, if you're not convinced, let's look at what Islam says about the gospel. Quran 3.3. He has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it. And he revealed the Torah and the gospel aforetime, a guidance for the people, and he sent the Quran. So the Torah and the gospel are revelations from Allah. And it's very important because every translation I know of except one, every translation I know of except one, doesn't translate uh, this, which is a phrase which occurs over and over again in the Quran, verifying that which is before it. Because a Muslim will look at this and say, yes, the Quran verifies that there was scripture before the Quran, but it's been corrupted. Uh, that's not what it actually says. It says, verifying bayna yadehi which in Arabic means, which is between your hands. What does this mean? If the Quran verifies the books you've already got between your hands, it's presupposing that you still have those books. They're between your hands. It says this over and over again with respect to the Christian and the Jewish scriptures, the books that you have between your hands. What's this mean? The Christians and Jews still had their scriptures. They hadn't been corrupted in the first century or the second century or the third century. And there are tons of passages like this in the Quran. We'll look at, uh, we'll look at just a few of the more interesting ones. Quran 1094, this one is actually directed to Muhammad. So the you there is singular. And when that happens in the Quran, this is directed to Muhammad specifically. Apparently, Muhammad was having some doubts about whether he's a prophet or not. And the revelation came down. If you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, Muhammad, ask those who read the book before you. Certainly the truth has come to you from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the disputers. Ask those who read the book before you. Christians and Jews are referred to as the people of the book because we had the book. Well, if Muhammad can go to Christians and Jews and ask them what's in the book, that means we still have the book. Otherwise, how are we reading the book? Surah 7, 157. Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, Muhammad, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the law and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. So, we open the law and the gospel and find references to Muhammad. Well, I don't think we do, but what's presupposed in this claim, it's presupposed that we open up our scriptures, that those scriptures are from God, and these scriptures uh, contain references to Muhammad. Surah uh, 5, verse 47 let the people of the gospel, this is funny, this is a command to Christians. Let the people of the gospel, that's us, judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. You can say this to any Muslim. Hey, I'm commanded to judge by what is in the gospel. Uh, therefore, Islam is false. That's <laughs> right. Well, believe in Islam. I can't. <laughs> I'm no better than those who rebel if I, if I don't judge Islam false. Because I I'm commanded in your Quran to judge by what I find in the gospel. I'm going to do that. This is the one command in the Quran I will obey. <laughs> and it tells me to reject everything else in the Quran. So, sorry. <laughs> Surah 568. Doesn't stop there. 
say, O oh, people of the book, Jews and Christians, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the law, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. Well, how can I, I have no ground to stand, on, stand upon unless I stand on the, on the foundation of the Torah and the gospel. How can I do that if they were corrupted in the first century? Why would Allah say this if it's been corrupted in the first century? Why wouldn't he say, whatever you do, don't go to that book, it's corrupted. That's not what it says. That's never what it says. Over and over and over again, the Quran affirms our scriptures. Why? You know, Muslims don't believe. I mean, if they, if they follow the Quran, they're not allowed to believe that anyone can corrupt God's word. Quran, chapter 6, verse 114 through 115. Shall I then seek a judge other than Allah? And it is he who hath revealed to you the book which is made plain. And those whom we have given the book know that it is revealed by your Lord with truth. Therefore, you should not be of the disputers. And the word of your Lord has been accomplished truly and justly. There is none who can change his words. And he is the hearing, the knowing. Who can corrupt the word of Allah? No one. But wait a minute. The gospel and the Torah are the word of God, according to Islam. One more. Surah 1827. And recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is none who can alter his words. There is none who can alter his words. Amen. Now, what's the point here? Well, I want to tell you from experience how a discussion with Muslims usually goes. Historically, the Muslim comes, talks to the Christian and says, your book has been corrupted. Um, I just looked through um, uh, the, the book by Thabiti, who uh, I was just looking through the book in his section on the, on the Bible. He said he's never been in a conversation with a Muslim where this didn't come up, where the corruption of the Bible didn't come up. And in almost every discussion, <laughs> Uh, between Christians and Muslims. Well, for the most part, Christians don't have an answer at all. Um, most Christians don't have an answer at all. Most Christians, you know, a Christian who would meet a Muslim on the street or something like that or in school or something, most Christians have no answer. Those Christians who do have an answer, it's usually related to textual criticism. Well, we can go, we can look at the history of the Bible, we can see uh, the history of the Bible, we can study textual manuscripts, we can affirm the accuracy of the New Testament, something like that. <coughs> There's something missing. There's something missing from the standard Christian response. The standard Christian response, you certainly want to include uh, evidence for the reliability of the New Testament, but uh, there's a much more complete response. If a Muslim says, your Bible's been corrupted, the response should be, well, one, why does the Quran say no one can corrupt the words of Allah? Why did it say that? Now, you just told me the word has been corrupted. Your Quran says no one can corrupt it. Uh, second, why does it tell why does, it t why does it say, why does the Quran say repeatedly that people still have access to the gospel? Third, why does the Quran command me to judge by the gospel? It's been corrupted according to you. And finally, I can, finally I can, show, you, uh, I can show you textual support for the Bible. Um, I think that would change things quite a bit in the world because Muslims in Christian Muslim uh, interactions are usually on the offensive and Christians are on the defensive. Muslims are uh, tossing out their criticisms and their attacks and Christians are trying to defend themselves uh, against these criticisms. Um, it, it's, very, it's very important. See, my, my friend Sam Shimon and I, we call this the Islamic dilemma. Dilemmas where you're in trouble if you go this way, you're in trouble if you go that way, those are the only two ways you can go, so you're in trouble. <laughs> this is the Islamic dilemma, because why? Well, if the Quran, as it does, over and over again, affirms the Christian, the, the Christian scriptures. And the, and the Christian scriptures declare that Islam is false, Muslims have a problem. Because if, there are only two possibilities, either the Christian scriptures are the word of God or they're not the word of God. Two possibilities here. If the Christian scriptures are the word of God, then Islam is false, because it contradicts the Christian scriptures. If the Bible's not the word of God, then Islam is false, because it constantly affirms it as the word of God. So if the Bible's true, Islam is false. If the Bible's false, the Islam is false. Either way, Islam is false. So whatever you want to think about Christianity, you need to reject Islam. And I, I think if Muslims got that through their heads, it wouldn't just be them attacking. They'd have something to think about, have something to sit back and think, wait a minute, I've got a problem here. Uh, and again, how many references do we go through? A few. If you get two or three of those down, you get two or three of those down, uh, things are, the conversation, trust me, the conversation's going to go very differently. Three stages of jihad. Why the turn to jihad? Interestingly, at the beginning, Muhammad says, you pagans, I disagree with you. I like the Christians and the Jews. 
Muhammad eventually has some interactions with the Jews. They reject him and they start making fun of him. Like, Muhammad, you have no clue what you're talking about. Everything you're saying totally contradicts what we, you, you picked up a few things, but come on, you're totally wrong here. Uh, then it became pagans and Jews, I don't like you. It's the Christians I like. And then by the end, Christians, Jews, pagans, you're all in trouble. You're all in trouble. Uh, the reason is that whenever Muslims had interactions with Christians and Jews, they pointed out the errors. And we have records of this. Not, not a, we don't have Christian sources from the time. We have Muslim sources. Uh, and the Muslim sources talk about this. So in the Quran, um, in the Quran, there's one Maryam. There's Maryam. You, you know, there, there's, there's, there's two famous Marys. There's Maryam, uh, the sister of Aaron and Moses. And there's Mary, the mother of Jesus. According to the Quran, it's the same person. Uh, and we actually have records uh, from Muslim sources where Christians started making fun of Muslims because, of <laughs> hey, you, you guys know that there's like 1,400 years in between them, right? You guys know that, right? I'm t this, this, is, this is how the, the Christians were saying to the Muslims, you guys know that, right? Because you're talking, about the, you're talking about the mother of Jesus being the sister of Moses and Aaron. What's going on here? <laughs> um, so this is what happens when Muhammad thinks these Christians and Jews are going to accept his message and they just start, start ridiculing his claims. And so you eventually get to jihad. Now, uh, this is important both for Christians, uh, because of what's going on in, uh, in uh, Muslim context, uh, where you have Christian minorities, um, but also because of the West. Um, this is, people just don't seem to grasp uh, the basic idea here. Uh, is Muslims have a concept of abrogation. Uh, one verse can conflict with another verse of the Quran. They can say the exact opposite thing. If there's a disagreement, all you do as a Muslim is look historically which one came later. Whichever one came later, that's the one that applies to you. And here's what happens, watch. So these are the verses on abrogation. So uh, Surah 16, verse 101, and when we change one communication for another communication, and Allah knows best what he reveals, they say, you are only a forger, nay, most of them do not know. People actually said, Muhammad, you're, contra you're, you're changing your revelations as you go along. Uh, you're a forger. And you know, the Quran says, no, no, he's not. Surah 2, 106, whatever communications we abrogate are caused to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? So Allah can give a verse, and later on gives a verse that cancels it, um, something better. Um, the reason this is important is you find some very different scriptures in the Quran. So you find, uh, Surah 2, 256, there's no compulsion in religion. Very peaceful verse. No compulsion in religion. You can't compel anyone to believe. I love that. Great verse. And the Quran also says, fight those who believe not in Allah. Wait a minute. I thought there's no compulsion in religion. Why are you fighting people because they don't believe? Now, in a Western context, if you're a, we if you're a Western Muslim who's, who actually likes America, you're not, you know, you're not like undercover jihadi or something like that. If you're a Western Muslim, the Western method of interpretation of your average Muslim would go, well, which one do I like better? I'll use that to reinterpret the, the other one. So I like the there's no compulsion in religion verse better, and therefore I'm going to use that to reinterpret the one that says fight those who do not believe and say, well, that must refer to just one particular group who, was at, who were attacking the Muslims. That's the Western method of interpretation. The classical Muslim method of interpretation, the method given by Muhammad, the method given by the rightly guided caliphs, the four leaders who were companions of Muhammad, and pretty much every great Muslim scholar who's ever lived is abrogation. Which one came last? That settles it. In Islam, you have three stages. This is according to the life of Muhammad. This is according to Muslim doctrine. This is according to any classical scholar of Islam. Stage one, when Muslims are outnumbered, they are to proclaim a message of peace. When Muhammad was a persecuted prophet in Mecca, he preached tolerance. To you be your religion and to me be my religion. As Surah 109 declares, say, O oh, you unbelievers. This is what Muslims are supposed to say to unbelievers in this context. I do not serve that which you serve, nor do you serve him whom I serve, nor am I going to serve that which you serve, nor are you going to serve him whom I serve. You shall have your religion and I shall have my religion. Great. Let's get along. You have your religion. I have my religion. That's when Muhammad had about 100 followers and was totally outnumbered by the polytheists in Mecca. A little later, Muhammad had far more followers, and he had uh, gained some allies among the tribes of Arabia. Then the message suddenly changed. Stage two, when Muslim numbers increase, 
they're permitted to engage in defensive jihad. When people persecute you, when they attack you, when they drive you out of an area, you can engage in defensive jihad if you have enough people. And so this revelation came down. Uh, Surah 22, permission to fight is given. So this is the first time Muslims were allowed to fight. Before this, they're not allowed to fight, and now they have permission. Permission to fight is given to those, not to all Muslims, to those upon whom war is made. If people are making war upon you, now you can defend yourself. Before, you couldn't defend yourself. Because they are oppressed, and most surely Allah is well able to assist them, those who have been expelled from their homes without a just cause, except that they say, our Lord is Allah. Now, Muslims in the West point to this verse and, you, and they say, you see, Islam only allows fighting in self-defense. Wrong. Wrong. This was not the final revelation. This is when Muslims had enough people to fight, but they didn't form a, major, a majority. When Muhammad conquered Mecca, when he conquered Mecca, the revelation changed again. This is shortly before his death. And it's important because Surah 9 is one of the last two surahs revealed. The other, the other one was Surah 110, which says practically nothing. It's only a couple verses. So Surah 9 of the Quran is the last major surah revealed. And that's where you find some very different teachings. Now it's no longer fight in self-defense, fight people who are attacking you first. Now you have uh, stage three. When Muslims are in a majority, they're commanded to engage in offensive jihad. Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger. So if Islam forbids something and you don't forbid something, so if Islam forbids eating pork and you don't forbid eating pork, um, they are commanded to fight you. Nor acknowledge the religion of truth. So even if you, just don't re if you just reject Islam at the end of the day, nor acknowledge religion of truth from among the people of the book uh, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, this, there is a difference here, you see. Uh, between the pagans. Uh, the, the, the Muslim response to the pagans is Surah 9.5, slay them wherever you find them. You give them time to get out. Other than that, slay them wherever you find them after the sacred months are over. Uh, with Christians and Jews, since we were people who once upon a time received revelation, we have a third option, pay the jizya. Um, you can pay for the right to continue to live. But notice, every single criterion here for fighting Unbelievers is one of belief or practice. It has nothing to do with attacking the Muslim community first. Um, fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day. So the reason this is important is this is Surah 9, the most violent surah of the Quran. These are the final marching orders. These are the verses that abrogate everyone, everything else that occurs. So if there's a conflict between this fight those who believe not in Allah, and Surah 2, 256, there's no compulsion in religion, this one abrogates it. And go to a Muslim commentary, look up Surah 2, 256. Sorry, that was abrogated by this. But in the West, you bring up a verse like this and they say, no, that can't be what it means because of these other peaceful verses. Very different method uh, of interpretation. People who are in the Middle East, scholars who are in the Middle East, go with the classical, the classical method of interpretation. People here in the United States, either honestly or deceptively, uh, go with a different method. Look at the peaceful verses of the Quran. That's what Islam actually teaches. With specific respect to Christians, uh, here's what Islam teaches about Christians. Christians who believe in the deity of Christ are unbelievers. This is crucial because there are verses that were revealed rather early that say nice things about the Christians. And Muslims are quick to point those out. Hey, it says right here, Christians, Jews, Muslims, everyone's okay. So it's 282. Uh, Christians, I mean, Christians, Muslims, and Jews are all okay. Well, that's not what the Quran says later on. Surah 5, you can put this together. Watch this. Christians who believe in the deity of Christ are unbelievers. It specifically says, those disbelieve who say, Jesus is God. Uh, so, the, um, so people who believe in the deity of Christ, among, from the people of the book, are unbelievers. Surah 98.6 goes a step further. Christians who disbelieve are the worst of creatures. According to the Quran, Muslims are the best of peoples. Christians who believe in the deity of Christ, I assume that's everyone here, you are the worst of creatures. So what happened to, what happened to that, what happened to the uh, Surah 2, which said that we're, we're fine? Well, I'm sorry, you're the worst of creatures. Um, Muslims must not be friends with Christians. Surah 551, do not be friends with the Jews and with the Christians, they are friends of each other. If you become a friend of them, you're one of them. 
you're a Jew or a Christian if you're friends with a Jew or a Christian. And of course, the, the passage we already read, Christians are to be fought and subjugated because of their unbelief. And it's interesting, we read Surah 929, which says, fight those who do not believe. The very next verse, Surah 930, gives the justification for fighting us. It says, Christians say, Jesus is the son of Allah, and they imitate the other disbelievers, the pagans. We imitate the pagans by saying that Jesus is God. That's the justification for, um, for fighting us. And that the, the end of that verse even says, may Allah destroy us, Christians and Jews. So, uh, that brings up the question, why don't you hear this from Muslims in the West? And there can be multiple reasons. There can be multiple reasons. And I'll say, because we're going to look at Takiya, which is, there are situations where Muslims are allowed to deceive Westerners. This gets overused uh, in criticisms of Islam, um, so that, I mean, people think every time a Muslim tells you anything, he's lying to you. It's not true. Um, most Muslims, most Muslims who are telling you what they believe, uh, telling you that Islam is a religion of peace, telling you they don't want to harm you, they're telling the truth. They, they really believe that. Um, and, and there can be many reasons um, for that. They might not know anything, which I find is standard. Uh, you know, Christians too. Um, your average Christian doesn't know a lot about Christianity, just like your average Muslim doesn't know much about Islam. Um, so they might not know anything, or they might, again, be relying on a Western method of interpretation where you go with the, the interpretation you like best, you go with the verse you like best, and you use that to reinterpret the other verses, rather than the traditional method of interpretation that goes back to Muhammad. Uh, but there's this other possibility. Someone might know exactly what Islam teaches, and uh, might believe that you need to be conquered and that you need to be fought, as uh, the Quran commands, um, and still tell you that Islam is a religion of peace. Why? Well, this goes back to the Quran. This is where uh, the word taqiyah comes from. Surah 328, let not the believers take disbelievers for their friends in preference to believers. Whoso doeth that hath no connection with Allah. So don't be friends with those unbelievers. You've got Muslims you can be friends with. Whoso doeth that, have, you have no connection with Allah if you're friends with those unbelievers, unless it be that ye but guard yourselves against them, taking, as it were, security. Allah biddeth you to beware only of himself unto Allah is the journey. Don't be friends with the unbelievers unless it's to protect yourself, unless it's to guard yourself. This is where we get the word taqiyah. And um, I'll give you the greatest Muslim commentary on this. The greatest, uh, according to um, almost any Muslim you'll ever see, the greatest commentator of the Quran of all time is Ibn Kathir. Um, the tafsir of Ibn Kathir is the greatest commentary on the Quran, good as gold. Here's what he says on this verse. Allah said next, unless you indeed fear a danger from them. So it's, um, you don't be friends with the Jews and Christians unless there's a danger from them. That would be in context where you're outnumbered, where Christians and Jews form a majority. Meaning, except those believers who in some areas or times fear for their safety from the disbelievers. In this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship to the disbelievers outwardly, but never inwardly. For instance, al-Bukhari recorded, Bukhari is the greatest collector of traditions from Muhammad, uh, al-Bukhari recorded that uh, Abu al-Darda said, we smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. Smile in their faces, curse them in your hearts. Uh, Al-Bukhari said that Al-Hasan, that's another companion of Muhammad, so uh, Adarda is a companion of Muhammad, Al-Hasan is a companion of Muhammad. Uh, Al-Hasan said, uh, the Tukiyah, that's Takiyah, is allowed until the day of resurrection. So what does this mean? If you're in a context where you're outnumbered by unbelievers, you pretend to be friendly and peaceful. You do not be friendly towards them, unless, unless it's to guard yourself from them, and you do that through deception, smiling in their faces, cursing them in their hearts. Now again, I just want to say, because I don't want anyone to get the, the wrong impression, I don't think most Muslims are doing this uh, here in the West. They really believe that Islam is peaceful. Um, point is, I don't know. I don't know. Because if you really are peaceful, if you really are a peaceful Muslim, you're going to say that Islam is peaceful. If you're not, you're supposed to say that Islam is peaceful. So either way, I don't know what you believe. I, I, once you have a command to deceive unbelievers, uh, I don't know whether to trust you or not. Uh, so, this is very important. Uh, in a Western context, uh, when we're constantly told Islam is a religion of peace, uh, Muslims are allowed to do that, even if they believe otherwise. And finally, uh, we'll just go through this, we'll just touch on this briefly, uh, because you hear so much about Muhammad. 
Here are some facts about Muhammad. You may have heard them. These are the ones that are, these are true. These are true. Stake my reputation on it. Debated on everything I'm saying here. Uh, no question that these are facts. Uh, one, Muhammad's first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic in origin. Muhammad started see receiving revelations. He ran out of the cave depressed and suicidal, and he tried to kill himself. He said he didn't want to be accused of being possessed. It was, and his wife finds him like this, suicidal and depressed. And it's actually his wife and her cousin who convince him, no, you're a prophet of God. You're too good to be possessed in this way. So you're actually a prophet. That's kind of important because Muslims, you know, hey, Muhammad is totally trustworthy. Um, we can believe in his revelations. Actually, my Muslim friends, the reliability of your religion doesn't depend on Muhammad. It depends on Muhammad's wife. Now, give me some reason to believe that she was an infallible, an infallible judge of truth. Uh, defend that. Uh, can't be done. Uh, Muhammad delivered certain verses of the Quran to his followers, then later claimed that Satan had tricked him. It's an interesting historical event. It's, it's, this is, if you've heard of the Satanic Verses, not the book by Salman Rushdie, um, that was the title he used to refer to this. Um, but there is the historical event when, according to the story, Muhammad uh, really wanted to see the Quraysh, his own tribe, the people of Mecca, uh, join him, join him in Islam. And he started longing for a revelation that would help them become Muslims. And one day he got the revelation he was looking for. It said, have you not heard of Allah, Alusa, and Manat, the third, the other? These are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. So the idea is there were three goddesses, Allah, Alusa, and Manat, who were called the, the cranes because they could intercede with Allah. They would take your prayer and take it up to Allah. These were the three main goddesses uh, of Muhammad's tribe. So the Quran affirmed them. Your three goddesses are okay. Tons of people converted, started bowing down in honor of this revelation, along with Muhammad and his followers. And then a little later, Muhammad comes back and says, you know those verses that I gave you? Uh, said those three goddesses were okay? The devil made me do it. <laughs> Satan tricked me. Uh, and then the, the, you know, the polytheists were especially mad. Hey, you, know, you tricked us too. Why is this important? Well... According to Muslim sources, not according to me, according to Muslim sources, Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from the devil. That, that matters, that kind of matters, uh, if he's telling us to believe these other revelations. Uh, and finally, Muhammad uh, believed that he was the victim of black magic. It's an interesting story. Muhammad started acting really weird, having delusional thoughts, false beliefs, and uh, for a period of between six months and two years, depending on the source, but it was a significant amount of time. Uh, Muhammad's walking around with these delusional thoughts and saying all kinds of weird things. And he finally snaps out of it and he says, a Jewish magician did this to me. The Jews did it. They got me. Uh, so, but this is important. Uh, why? Well, according, also according to the Quran, black magic is demonic. Magic is demonic. So <laughs> demonic activity could uh, have an impact on the beliefs and behavior of the greatest messenger of God in history. The reason this is important, I, I bring this up, see, a high priest of Wicca once tried to cast a spell on me. Um, <laughs> uh, I was talking to some of, his, uh, some of his followers, and he casted a spell on me. He had someone come and get threads from my clothes and so on. Uh, you know what happened? He died. <laughs> I don't know if God killed him or what, but I mean, I know his spell didn't work on me. Um, now, here... He who's greater, he who's in me is you know, greater than he who's in the world. Uh, but think about that. You've got a high priest of Wicca casting a spell on me. Doesn't work at all. Jew gets a hair from Muhammad's hairbrush, casts a spell on him. He's messed up for a year. <laughs> Very unconvincing to tell me I should trust anything this man says. So those are some of the spiritual issues. Uh, there are more. If you've heard that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl named Aisha, absolutely 100% true. In fact, there aren't many facts you can know with more certainty than this one. It's over and over and over again because so many of the Muslim traditions uh, come from Aisha herself, come from Muhammad's wife Aisha. And she always talks about uh, how she became his wife and she always says, I was nine, I was playing on a swing, they came to get me, I had my dolls with me. Um, so you have this over and over and over again. 
in the Muslim sources. Any, put it this way, any Muslim who wants to deny this, and some do here in the West, has to throw out everything. Uh, you don't know anything about Muhammad if you don't know this, because you have this in every one of your sources over and over again. If you've heard Muhammad had more wives than his own revelations allow, that's absolutely correct. Surah 4.3 says you can have one wife or two wives or three wives or four wives. That's it. That's, you have a four-wife limit. Muhammad had nine. And if you're wondering why, Muhammad got a special revelation, Surah 3350, which gave him and him alone the right to have more sexual partners. Muhammad, you can marry anyone you want. Very interesting when the founder of the religion gets special moral privileges. And here's another special moral privilege. Muhammad married the divorced wife of his own adopted son. If you've heard that, absolutely correct. Interestingly, got revelations to justify it because he had, told, he had said you can't do that. Uh, so, this was uh, Zayd and Zainab. Muhammad had an adopted son named Zayd. It was called Zayd bin Muhammad. Zayd, son of Muhammad. And Zayd had a wife who was one of the most beautiful women in Arabia. Her name was Zainab. And one day Muhammad goes over to visit his adopted son, and he walks in and sees Zainab half naked. And he starts praising God. Praise Allah, praise Allah. And walks out. She realizes, she realizes that Muhammad is attracted to her, and his adopted son realizes that he's attracted to her. He says, Muhammad, I'm going to divorce her. I'm going to divorce her so that you can have her. So he divorces his wife. Muhammad marries her, not right away. The revelations had to come first because people start saying, wait a minute, you can't do that. You've been going around saying you can't marry the wives. Uh, you can't marry the wives of your sons. Well, that's when Muhammad got revelation. These are all in Surah 33. One of which says, no more adoption. No more adoption. Muslims to this day, Muslims to this day, do not practice adoption if they, if they follow their religion. No adoption in Islam. It was canceled. So that Muhammad could marry the woman. And the Quran actually justifies this, Surah 33, 37, says, since people really need to know that there's no problem marrying the divorced wives of their adopted sons, Muhammad, I need you to do this. So it was actually required by Allah for Muhammad to marry this beautiful woman whose divorce he had caused um, to show people that if you're having this moral dilemma, if you're having this moral problem, do I marry her or do I not? Uh, you have the example from Muhammad. Now who deals with this? Who, who, anyone in here ever struggled whether you're going to marry the divorced wife of your adopted son? No. And the reason that's especially interesting is another verse in Surah 33, again, abolished adoption. So now you're having Allah saying, Muhammad, I really, need to, I really need Muslims to know that it's okay to marry the wives of their adopted sons. And then another verse says, by the way, there's no more adoption. Well, what, what was the point of that then? There's no point to it anymore. You're not going to marry the divorced wives of your adopted sons because there's no more adoption. So why reveal that? Seems awfully convenient here. Uh, so these are just a couple of facts uh, about Muhammad that you may have heard. And finally, um, some myths about Muhammad. These are the fiction these are the fictions here. You can put up many more, um, but these are some that come up um, repeatedly. Muhammad performed miracles. According to the Quran, Muhammad performed no miracles. His only miracle is the Quran itself. That's Muhammad's miracle according to the Quran. Over and over and over again, Muhammad performed no miracles. In the Hadith, teachings about Muhammad uh, outside of the Quran, it says Muhammad performed all kinds of miracles. The reason is the Hadith come from two centuries later. Christian, I mean, uh, uh, when, when Christians were approached by Muslims, the Muslim, we know this historically, here's, here's, here's the interaction between Christians and Muslims for the first 150 years of Islam. Um, hey, you Christians, you need to believe in Allah and his messenger. Well, we believe in Jesus, he rose from the dead. What did Muhammad do? Well, he, he made this awesome book. <laughs> Lovely calligraphy. You should believe it. Uh, what? Uh, what? What's that? What, what are you talking about? A book? We got a, re we got a resurrection. You know, Moses, he part of the Red Sea, and you're talking about, you're talking about a book. Uh, and then, all of a sudden, Muslims started coming up with all these miracle stories. Um, Muhammad split the moon in half. That's, bigger than the red, that's better than the Red Sea. Uh, Muhammad split the moon in half. They started coming up with all these wonderful miracle stories. Muhammad, you know, water could come out of his fingertips when people are, were thirsty and so on. Uh, so you have lots of Muslims who believe Muhammad performed all kinds of miracles despite the fact that the Quran repeatedly affirms he didn't perform any miracles. And the reason is Muslims needed that. They needed, they needed, uh, they needed some, some things to tell Christians and Jews about. So that's a myth. 
Um, Muhammad promoted tolerance. You saw the verses. Uh, Muhammad promoted tolerance when it was convenient for him. When Muslims were in a majority, there is, no, there is to be no tolerance. In fact, uh, according to the Quran, Surah 4735, if, uh, if Muslims are supposed to be uppermost, if they're, in a, if, they're in a, if they're in an area where they formed the majority, they are not to seek peace. There are no terms of peace at all. And finally, Muhammad defended women's rights. Uh, I hear this over and over and over again. I see people in the media saying Muhammad was, he was virtually a feminist. I have, absolute, I have absolutely no clue uh, what people are thinking. In Islam, if your wife gets out of line, uh, you beat her into submission. In Islam, the testimony, the, the trial testimony of a woman is worth half that of a man. Uh, women actually asked Muhammad why. He said, it's because you're stupid. He said, the, it's, because, it's due to the deficiency of your intellect. Um, you have all kinds of problems that go back to Muhammad himself. If a woman wants to accuse a man of raping her, she has to have four male Muslim witnesses in good standing with the community to bear witness that they witnessed it. This is wreaked havoc. Uh, this is wreaked havoc in the Muslim world. Uh, and the reason is, a woman gets raped, she can't go and accuse the guy, unless there were four guys standing there. They're just standing around watching and they're willing to testify. Um, so if they're not, if you don't have that, if you don't have those four witnesses willing to testify, then you cannot, there can be no conviction against the man. Well, what's the problem? Some of the women get pregnant. And so they know the woman has been engaged in sexual activity. They can't convict the man, they can convict the woman. And it's been estimated, I forget whether it was Afghanistan or Pakistan, it was one of the two. Uh, it's estimated 75% of, uh, of the women in prison are there for being raped. For being raped and for accusing a man and not being able to get a conviction or um, for getting pregnant and not being able to prove a case. Uh, horrible situation goes back to Islam. And it, just a little historical note here, the reason uh, for that revelation, Muhammad's wife Aisha had been accused of sleeping with someone. And Muhammad was depressed, he didn't know how he was going to settle the case, and then he said, well, if she's guilty, bring your four witnesses. Oh, you can't, she's innocent. So these things that really just seemed to be morally convenient for Muhammad at the time are now uh, absolutely wreaking havoc in the world. Now, I don't know what time we have left, but questions? Any questions on, have you been wondering anything about Islam? Yeah, Chris? Um, I think you're saying that slightly in an extreme way, uh, that it's good to rape her in the presence of her husband. Um, uh, it's acceptable. It's certainly acceptable. And this, goes, this, is, this is Surah 424 of the Quran, which says, married women are forbidden to you to have sex with. Uh, married women are forbidden to you unless, unless they're your captives, unless your right hand possesses them. And so that verse is interesting in itself. You can't have sex with a married woman unless you've captured her, unless you have physically captured her. Uh, why that's interesting is we know from the Hadith what was the historical situation, what was the historical scenario. Muslims had conquered a town. Muslims had conquered a town. And lots of times they'd kill the men and take the women and children captive. This time they took the men captive as they took the, the men captive too. And for a significant period of time, uh, for a significant period of time, the Muslims didn't have sex with their captives, even though the Quran allows them to have sex with their captives. Um, they didn't have sex with their captives because their husbands were alive, so they're still married women. And so eventually they go to Muhammad and they say, hey, we don't want to have sex with these captive women because their husbands are still alive. Good. What a great idea. I mean, that's, 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 a, that's a, I like that. Don't do it. They're married. Stop it. Control yourself. Uh, then Surah 424 came down. That's the historical situation. They ask Muhammad a question. Then the verse comes down. Married women are forbidden to you unless you captured them. And so this allowed men, this allowed the Muslim men uh, to rape these captives whose husbands were sitting right there. Interesting stuff. Yeah? Uh, along those lines, um, I understand there are no homosexuals in Islam, correct? I mean, where do they base that on? Do they have a basis or just a preference? Uh, no, homosexuals are to be killed um, in Islam. No, no, you do have 
um, homosexuals who consider themselves Muslim. So there's one at New York University, Ursad Manji, uh, who's a lesbian. Um, uh, and, you know, she's reinterpreted Islam. She called for reform in Islam. But no, you, yeah, you certainly can't be a devout Muslim um, and think that homosexuality is, uh, is okay. Uh, you have to be killed. Yeah. yeah? Can you explain the relationship between the name Allah and the moon god? Uh, well, uh, I, I think this gets... I think the, this argument gets, um, gets overused um, because I think, I think Muslims could, could, could reasonably answer this. So you have, uh, you have three goddesses who are called the daughters of Allah, who are also called uh, you know, the daughters of the moon. So Allah is the god of the moon, no problem. Um, and so it, you know, uh, critics of Islam point this out. Hey, wait a minute, Allah is the moon god. Um, you know, you, you had tons of gods for all kinds of things, and then you took Allah, the moon god, and made him the chief god, and then tossed all the others aside. Come on. Uh, you took a pagan god. But I, I, I think a Muslim could just say that was, you know, that got corrupted over time. So originally Allah was the supreme god, and eventually the pagans, the polytheists, had you know, reduced him to just the god of the moon. And uh, So I, I think, I think they, could, they could answer that. Um, so there, there is a connection between Allah and, and the moon. That's why well, you've got the crescent moon. Uh, as a symbol of Islam, um, but I mean, if, if you imagine, they f suppose that you know archaeologists find some statue of Yahweh along alongside a bunch of other gods or something like that, we wouldn't say, oh, therefore Yahweh is a you know is a is a pagan god or something. We'd say that area corrupted uh, corrupted the, the the true teachings. What else? Oh yeah. Thanks. Uh, what does the Quran teach about creation? About the creation uh, about the Um, it, it's, it's, yeah, uh, yeah, over and over again. Um, teaches, uh, teaches um, creation is either six days or eight days, depending on which, which, uh, which story you go to. Uh, the difference is Adam and Eve are created in paradise. Um, so they're created in heaven, uh, not on earth. They get cast down to earth as punishment. So um, Adam and Eve are created in paradise. There are the, it's actually, it's actually a very interesting situation. Um, Allah in the Quran commands the spirit beings, the jinn, the angels, and so on, not to bow down before anyone except Allah. You don't bow to anyone but Allah. Also, according to the Quran, when he creates Adam, he says, all of you angels bow down to Adam. And Satan says, no, not doing it. And that's why he's cast down, which is very interesting. <laughs> You told me not to bow down. I'm not bowing down. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, so what you have is you have, there's, there's already these, these beings that are created from different things. So uh, the, the jinn are created from fire. Man is created uh, from clay. This is in paradise. Adam and Eve sin. They get cast down to this world as punishment. Uh, and then, you know, things proceed. But they have the flood. They have, they have other things uh, in the Quran. What, what's kind of interesting is Muslims say they don't believe in original sin. Uh, you'll, you'll always hear that. We don't believe in original sin. It's a very uh, quick, easy question to bring up. Well, if being here in this world is punishment, you're a baby, you're born in this world, you haven't sinned yet, why are you being punished when you haven't sinned yet? So they, in other words, Adam and Eve end up here because they're being punished, but we're all here as well, even before, even with no reason. Um, why are we being punished for sins that Adam committed? So you can actually, Muhammad didn't think through this stuff very carefully when he's, uh, when he's coming up with these things. Yeah? First of all, this was wonderful, and we're, we're in your depth today. I appreciate it very much. Secondly, do you have this presentation on a DVD available to us? And third, is the, the harem warfare of the Old Testament, the destruction of the Canaanites uh, for their paganism, is that brought to you by Muslims at all in their, when there's discussion of jihad? And how do you answer them? Um, well, yes, Muslims bring this up regularly. Uh, I find it interesting that many Muslims will, will bring it up uh, to condemn, um, to condemn the Old Testament. You see, that can't be the word of God. It talks about going on and killing all these people and stuff like that. Um, uh, the problem is, again, their book affirms our book. 
And in fact, the Quran specifically talks about Joshua's wars um, uh, against, uh, against the, the unbelievers, against the Canaanites. Uh, so you have that in the Quran, and Muslim can't reject it. But as far as bringing up, Muslims will use it in a different way. They'll bring it up as a defense. When you say, hey, why is Islam so violent? Why does it call for fighting unbelievers? Um, the, the difference, the difference between Judaism, Christianity on one hand and Islam on the other is not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament do you have fighting people to convert them. Um, you don't. Um, in, uh, in the Old Testament, fighting them because of their horrendous immorality, they had a chance to repent, they refused to repent, God warns them now, now they are judged, now they are judged for their immorality. Um, it's never go and convert the entire world. Um, to Judaism or go and fight and convert the entire world um, to Christianity through warfare. Uh, so basically in the Old Testament you have, here's the land I'm giving you, and you can fight to defend your land. And in, Christi and in Christianity, um, we don't fight for Christianity in the, of, in, in the sense of fighting, uh, going out and fighting unbelievers at all. Um, in Islam, you fight everyone. Uh, you fight everyone. Fight those who do not believe. Those are all unbelievers. Muhammad said, Muhammad said, in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, there are two most trusted collections of teachings from Muhammad. If, 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 you're not, if you don't know what that means, uh, the Quran is officially a revelation that came down from God. Got nothing to do with Muhammad, except for he's the one that received it and said, this is Allah's word, Allah's literal word that's eternal. The Hadith contains the actual teachings of Muhammad. So what did Muhammad teach, which are authoritative as well? Now, he's the prophet. Um, in the Hadith, Muhammad said, I've been commanded by Allah. I've been commanded to fight people until they say, La ilaha il Allah, and they establish prayer, uh, prayer and pay the zakat. So you've been commanded to fight people until they become Muslims. And Ibn Kathir, uh, again, the greatest Muslim commentator of all time. Interesting commentary on Surah 2, 256. So um, 2, 256 of the Quran, again, is a verse which says there's no compulsion in religion. You hear that over and over again if you bring up... Uh, that Islam is not tolerant or something like that. Surah 2, 256, Ibn Kathir's commentary on it, he says, this has been abrogated by the later commands to fight them. And after he discusses this a little while, he says, therefore, all people of the world should be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to come or refuses to pay the jizya, they should be fought till they are killed. Um, so, yeah, you don't have anything like that, anything close to that uh, in the Bible. Yep. Yeah? Um, well, a Muslim will tell you, a Muslim will tell you that they, that they have the kind of phrase, we don't believe in original sin, we believe in original innocence. Uh, and they have, uh, you, again, you have all kinds of problems with that, uh, namely that we're all here as punishment, and according to them, we haven't, been, we haven't sinned yet, so why are we being punished? Um, uh, but you have, some, you have some other issues. You have the fact that Muhammad taught that um, uh, because of Eve, because of Eve's disobedience, that's why women sin, that's why women are stupid, that's why women menstruate. Well, why do women have to go through all of this because of, because of Eve? Uh, so you have, you have, you have all the teachings. It's, it's, it's like Muhammad just you know, took things from all over the place and never thought through the theology uh, of what he was saying. Um, on, uh, you know, another issue with sin is, on the surface, on the surface, Muslims seem to understand that sin is horrendous. I mean, if you, what, what's the penalty for this? What's the penalty for that? Death, kill, chop off hands, 100 lashes, uh, v very strong punishments uh, for sin. But at the end of the day, it really looks like just social control. Because at the end of the day, they don't seem to understand how severe sin is. So um, main difference between Christianity and Islam with, with respect to sin is Allah's justice is not perfect. At the end of the day, Allah can just forgive you. There is no sacrifice for your sins. Uh, and so, matter of fact, I'll bring up another point right now. Uh, Allah's love isn't perfect either. Uh, according to the Quran, Allah has no love for unbelievers. Allah has no love for unbelievers. It says in Surah 332, Allah does not love unbelievers. So in the Quran, Allah has no love for unbelievers, and also Allah, at the end of the day, you die, He can just forgive you of your sins. All right, I forgive you of those. But what's that mean? It means... There's going to be unpunished sin. Not all sin is punished in Islam. Allah just sweeps it under the rug. Very different from Christianity where at the end of time all sin has been punished.
Every, every last sin that has ever occurred has been punished either on Jesus Christ or you take it yourself. Yep. After 9 11, we started hearing a lot about the reward, the jihadists would be the 72 version. Where did that originate from and how did that develop in time to where now it seems to be the popular view? Well, the, the number 72 uh, doesn't come from the Quran. You're promised, uh, you're promised your huris um, in the Quran. Uh, Muslims are promised their horis in paradise. Uh, these are large-breasted virgins who their, vir their virginity is perpetually restored. There's, a, there's actually a, a narration that goes back to Aisha when she was told about this, when, when they were told, and their hymens will be restored every day. Uh, and she goes, oh, how painful. Uh, so, so this is Muhammad's nine-year-old wife. Um, um, so, yeah, but yes, in, in the Hadith, not in the, you, in the Quran, you are promised your, so there are a couple issues here. In the Quran, you are promised your virgins in paradise, but you don't have a guarantee. You don't have a guarantee uh, for paradise. The only one who, had, who is guaranteed paradise, 100%, is the person who dies fighting the unbelievers. Those are the only people who are guaranteed paradise. Other than that, it's a, it's a crapshoot. And Muhammad himself said, I do not know what will happen to me. I don't know what will happen to me after death. Um, and Abu Bakr, Muhammad's closest companion and the first rightly guided caliph, said, if I had one foot in paradise, I would still fear Allah's deception. So if I had one foot in paradise, I would wonder if I'm really going to make it there. Uh, there is no guarantee except for... Uh, the person who dies fighting the unbelievers. And that actually, that, that first came about, Muslims were fighting a battle and they were losing, and Muhammad said, all right, anyone who dies gets paradise, and then they became much, much more fierce uh, in their fighting. Uh, so, uh, again, a couple of issues here. One, the Quran guarantees Muslims their, their virgins in paradise. Uh, generally, the, it's the Hadith that talk about gar being, guaranteed, um, being guaranteed paradise if you die finding the unbelievers. And the number 72 comes from the Hadith as well, uh, but that's a minimum. That's a minimum. If you're a really good Muslim, you could get many more. You could get far more um, virgins uh, in paradise. And interestingly, in the Hadith, Muhammad promised his followers that they would have eternal erections. So, and this was in a response, this was in a response to the question, will we have the strength for it? Will we have the strength for all this sex? Allah promises miraculous sexual abilities uh, in paradise. Uh, Chris, are we, is our, is our time up? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 have a, you, have a, you have a split between the Sunnis and the Shias. It originally started over, Muhammad dies from, he was poisoned. Um, he was poisoned by uh, a Jewish woman. Um, Muhammad dies and one group says he said that Abu Bakr is gonna, should be leader, and the other group says no, he said Ali should be the leader, and some sided with Ali, some sided with Abu Bakr, and you eventually ended up with uh, the Sunnis and the Shias. It started as a political difference, but since they believed in a different, a different uh, authority, so Shias will tend to reject teachings of Abu Bakr, quotations from Abu Bakr, Aisha. Um, since you ended up with a different emphasis, uh, you ended up with some differences in theology, although, although the main differences are political, but Shias are much more likely to uh, you know, make shrines at, you know, uh, at graves and so on. Um, but then you have, you have disagreements in Shia Islam. Uh, so Iran, mostly Shia Muslims. Uh, you have differences there, and then the Twelvers, um, those are the ones who, you had your 12 Imams, and then the final Imam, he went and hid in a cave, and he's been there for centuries, and eventually he's gonna come out, he's gonna come out in Rule, rule the Muslim community. Yeah? yeah what's the difference between um, Muslims and you know, Islam, the nation of Islam, the five descendants? Yeah. Uh, well, Muslims would say, Orthodox Muslims would say, and I would agree with them, that, um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that uh, people in the nation of Islam, and definitely the five percenters, uh, are, 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 are not Muslims. Um, you can't have in Islam an incarnation uh, of Allah. And five percenters say they're all God. So 5% say we're all, I mean, not us, um, but they say that they're gods. 
Um, so if from a from an Orthodox Muslim position, uh, there's no way to recon there's no way to reconcile that with the teachings uh, with the teachings of Islam, which is why they have to say, ah, there's a secret book that was that goes back to Muhammad, and it's been a secret for all these times. Which, uh, no question, that's that's not it's not right. Yeah. I've read in articles by well-meaning people that since uh, Muhammad is a descendant of Ishmael and quotes the Bible and the Quran, that basically Allah and the God that was worshipped by the Jews and Christians, it's just the same God. Is there any good short answer to that? Obviously, all the theological things you presented here really are a larger answer. Well, if, if, if a Muslim says, hey, you know, do we believe in the same God? I say, what do you mean? Uh, we both believe in a being that created the world. Uh, we both believe in an all-powerful being. Uh, yeah, okay, I believe in that too. Um, but at the end, of the, the main differences would be, according to the Quran, Allah is a father to none. Uh, the highest relationship you can have with Allah is slave to master. Um, he is a father to no one. Um, so, in Christianity, God is our father. In Islam, you cannot have a relationship like that uh, with God. So that's one. Um, we believe God is triune. We believe God is triune. Um, in Islam, um, in Islam, he's, he's not. Um, we believe in you know incarnation, things like that. Um, so these are main differences. Um, but also, uh, Allah is just uh, almost completely arbitrary. I mean, that's why you have Muhammad saying, "I don't know what's going to happen." I don't know what's going to happen to me. I mean, I can't imagine Jesus or the apostles saying, "I don't know what's going to happen." Though. I don't know what's going to happen if I die. Oh, I'm scared. <laughs> Um, so, so, so you have that, and you have uh, the fact that, that Allah has no love for anyone except for good Muslims, whereas you know, Christ died for us while we were, while we were yet sinners. Uh, so, anything else? Yep. Just a question. Uh, many believe that the Antichrist will be the Muslim Imam, the Mahdi. Could you explain a little about the Mahdi and many... Islamic people's expectation of his coming and his power and his global authority? Um, well, you have a ton of strange and conflicting uh, teachings. Um, as far as the, the, the Mahdi is going to be someone who, you know, who comes along to, to help restore and stuff like that. The final judgment in Islam is by Jesus. Jesus comes back, uh, judges everyone. He's going to kill all Christians and Jews, uh, destroy all crosses, kill all pigs, and you know, that'll be the final uh, that'll be the final. Um, stage as far as you know, linking uh, with uh, linking with the Antichrist, it is. I mean, it is. It is kind of important because you have lots of people say, "Ah, the Catholic Church, that's the the Antichrist." If you look at every location associated with the end times, every one is somewhere in the Middle East. I mean, it's all over the Middle East. Um, there, uh, let me put it differently: uh, it's all Muslim areas uh, that are associated with with the end times uh, biblically. Um, so it would seem, it would seem that it has, it's going to have something, um, you know, unless, unless certain locations are, are metaphorical or something like that. Um, but you know, as far as the actual locations mentioned, all, all over the place, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's Muslim areas. So, um, but I'm not uh, uh, outside my field on uh, on end times. Yeah. It's kind of a minor point, but it's something that's puzzled me. Um, you alluded to Jesus killing pigs. I know Muslims also have a horror of dogs and of mice. Mm -hmm. And how does that reconcile with the idea that God is the creator of all things when, when it seems like some of God's creatures are inherently evil? I just never understood how that could, uh, um, could go. Yeah, there, 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 there's no official Muslim reconciliation. Individual Muslims could try to argue why. Uh, but you have Muhammad, he teaches God created all of this, and you have Muhammad that, you know, the pig is unclean, kill all dogs, kill lizards, kill mice. Um, you, you have a, some sources say you kill all dogs, and some Muslims go with that, go with that hadith. Others say just, it just refers to black dogs. Um, I own a black dog, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> he's got to die. He's, he's got he's to go. Muhammad's, Muhammad's, Muhammad said it, it, black dogs are uh, possessed by jinn. So your dog is possessed, according to Islam. And, she does you know, sound like Robin Williams. Yeah. Really nice. <laughs> <laughs> On a side note, that's always, that's always bothered me. I had a, I, I, my dog once saved my great-grandmother. Um, he saved her life and stuff. It's, you, know, it's a, you never find a more loyal animal ready to... Actually, that's probably a connection. That is the animal most willing to lay down its life for you. You've got that Christian concept of you know, sacrifice. You know, like that. You know, got to kill those animals. They'll make people start thinking it's good to, uh, you know, to have a sacrifice. Uh, anything else? Yep. Is the hadith on par with the Quran in terms of inspiration? 
<clears throat> um, if there's a conflict, the Quran wins. So if the Quran and the Hadith ever contradict one another, uh, then the Quran wins. That is the official perfect word uh, of God. But if there isn't a conflict, um, Muslim, Muslims have grades of uh, hadith, the, the plurals, ahadith. Um, but you can have your sahih hadith, these are, these are the most reliable ones. So, and that generally when I quote, when I quote hadith, it's from sahih al-Bukhari or sahih Muslim. They consider those the, the most trusted. Um, but you have levels. You have, you have your sahih, then you have your, your hasan, which are okay, but not, not completely reliable. And then you have your daif, which there, there's a problem. Uh, there, there's a question mark after it of whether, uh, whether it really goes back to Muhammad. Um, but yes, your Sahih Hadith, your Sahih Hadith. So if you quote something from Sahih Muslim or Sahih uh, al-Bukhari, and you can get these, you can get these online at Amazon. Um, get the whole collection translated in English. Uh, they're, they're even available online if you want to look them up. Um, but those are as good as gold, again, unless there is a direct contradiction. Um, because these are the teachings of Muhammad. This is what Muhammad said. So Muhammad said this. Muhammad can't so contradict the Quran. Yeah. So, so if there is a contradiction, uh, you would always go back to the Quran. So, so abrogation would not apply to the Hadith. Well, uh, inter interestingly, there there are a couple there are a couple of situations where uh, the Hadith are said to to abrogate, and the the, the idea is the doctrine of stoning. Uh, Umar, second rightly guided caliph, said there's supposed to be a verse in the Quran about stoning women, uh, and he says it, it ended up not in the Quran. Um, so that's a situation where uh, Muslims in the modern world and Muslim countries look at it and say, okay, there's no verse of stoning in the Quran. The Quran says if you get caught in sexual sin, 100 lashes. That's what it says. So why the stoning? Well, you also have Muhammad saying you, you stone them to death. So that's a situation where some Muslims look at it and say, okay, the Quran says, um, the Quran says 100 lashes, but we know this one goes, Muhammad commanded this, and so uh, we'll say... Uh, we'll say it abrogates it. But the, 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 first, the first thought would be try to reconcile them. Um, the, the first thought, if there's a conflict, would be, especially, if, I mean, if it's something that, that goes back to Muhammad, they have multiple quotations from it in their reliable sources, uh, they're going to, in general, it's, it's let's reconcile it this way. And generally, in the, in the reliable uh, traditions, you don't find much that, uh, that would flat out contradict uh, the Quran. What are some of these other reliable uh, sources? Well, they, they, anyone can, can write a collection of hadith. So right now I could sit down and write, this is my collection of, of hadith. So what you have, when you have Sahih al-Bukhari, you have Imam Bukhari, who's a Muslim scholar. He said, here are my criteria for determining the most reliable hadith. And I'm going to go out and find, because the stories just got passed on, they're all over the place. And so you go around collecting narrations. So Muslims treat him as the most reliable because they believe he had the most reliable methodology and he was the most thorough. Uh, and the other is Imam Muslim, who they also believe had, uh, along with Bukhari, the most reliable methodology for determining true narrations from false narration. Now, B Bukhari would go up to someone and say, hey, tell me the story I heard that you know. Okay, where did you get that from? And where did he get it from? And where did he get it from? And where did he get it from? Back to the time of, try and trace it back to the time of Muhammad. And once he had traced it back to the time of Muhammad, he would look to every name on the list in the chain of transmission and ask, is this guy trustworthy? Is this guy reliable? Uh, if so, then you know these guys aren't lying. You know this goes back uh, to Muhammad. So those are what are considered the, ha the sahih hadith, the, the reliable hadith. Uh, but you can have you know, question marks after certain people's names. So he got it from him. I don't know. This guy's kind of shaky. I don't know if I can completely trust him. And so you can't completely trust the story. And then you have someone's missing. I don't know where they got I don't know who got it from who. Um, or someone's really shaky on there, I, I, you know, this guy might have made things up, then you, you, know, you tend not to trust them. But you have, um, in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, it's, they're all reliable. That's why they're the most trusted collections, because ev the, every one is considered reliable. And then other collections, they include even uh, Daif narrations, so they include the weakest. And their, their attitude would be, let's put this in here so maybe we can later vindicate it. Uh, because maybe it does actually go back to Muhammad, but as of right now, there, we, don't, we don't know if it's true or not. So you have all kinds of, uh, all kinds of collections out there. Why don't you take one more question? Did anybody uh, yep. ask a question? Anybody who has not asked a question? Did I pass the sign? You didn't ask a question, did you? No, nah, he didn't ask a question. All right, let's take the last two. Okay. All right, you go first. When you're dealing with the application, it seems like a natural response by a Muslim would be the Christians, Old, old Covenant, New Covenant, Old Testament versus New Covenant, mm -hmm. New Covenant. 
light of them saying, well, you have the same thing in your faith? Well, it's, it, it, there's a massive difference. So in Christianity, we have covenants. So God makes a, a covenant with Adam. God makes a covenant with Noah. God makes a covenant with Abraham. God makes a covenant with Moses. Uh, and God ultimately makes a covenant in the blood of, you know, with the blood, us, in the blood of Jesus. Um, so we have different covenants in the Bible. Uh, that's very different from abrogation of the Quran. Uh, one day, Muhammad, so in the Quran, in the Quran, you have uh, the penalty for sexual sin is house arrest for life. You also have, in the Quran, the penalty for sexual sin is a hundred lashes. Now, wait a minute, this verse says the penalty for sexual sin is house arrest. This one says the penalty is a hundred lashes. In the Hadith you have the penalty is stoning. What's going on here? What's going on here? Uh, and so, in Christianity, in Christianity, the, the two main differences. One, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a, on a much more massive scale. You have a covenant and then um, over a thousand years goes by and then you have, you have another covenant. Number two, you're promised the new covenant in the writings under the old covenant. So even under the old covenant, in the Old Testament, we're told, oh, by the way, this isn't the final covenant. The real covenant, the final covenant uh, is eventually coming. Uh, where in Islam, Muhammad gives a revelation one day, and in fact, sometimes it would be just a few minutes later, <laughs> Um, Muhammad gives one revelation, and then another one comes along a little after it, and people started actually ridiculing Muhammad because of that. Hey, you're just, you know, you're kind of make, you're making this up as you go along. Um, so, I, I mean, I would say, look, here's, where, here's in the Old Testament where we are promised a new covenant. Um, why is it in Islam that you have these contradictory teachings um, and that you say one abrogates another? Because, uh, this, this would be the, the final idea on this point, the Quran also says that if the Quran were not from Allah, they would, have found, they would have found discrepancies and contradictions in it. Well, wait a minute, here's a problem. Now you've got a problem. Now you've got a problem because Muslims believe the Quran is eternal. It's been eternal. Uh, it's always been. The Quran is eternal, and in that eternal Quran, so before you start getting these revelations and they're abrogating each other and so on, in the Quran you have, for example, one claim, the penalty for sexual sin is house arrest. Two, you have the claim that the penalty for sexual sin is 100 lashes, and three, the claim that there's no discrepancies in this eternal Quran. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, you do. Uh, so the Quran, from all eternity, contradicts itself. Uh, we don't have that with, with you know, yeah. distinction among the covenants. Did you answer Pastor Stein's? Uh, no. David, um, you know, of course, the hotbed issue right now is the mosque. Now, is it true that a mosque is a declaration of dominion in that area? Um, you know, it... An individual Muslim doesn't have to have that attitude, but historically, think about it, historically Muhammad starts off in Mecca. The Kaaba, which is the center of Muslim worship right now, was a pagan center of worship. That's what it was. Every record we ever have, as far as history is concerned, that was always a pagan mosque. Uh, what did Muhammad go for as soon as he conquered the area? He took over the Kaaba, smashed all the idols. Um, when Muslims conquered Jerusalem. What did they do? Temple Mount. We want a mosque there. Uh, over and over and over again, when Muslims conquer an area, it's uh, either tear down the old places and build a mosque, or um, just convert, just convert the, just convert the, the old church or the old uh, synagogue into a mosque. And that's been every place because historically those places were always the center. Um, the the worship centers were like the center of that you know, was people's focus. In in the West, we don't have a place like that. We don't have this is the religious center uh, of America. You don't, you don't have that. You do have an economic center. That was the World Trade Center. Uh, level it. And again, I, don't, you know, I, don't, I, I can't look into anyone's heart, so I don't know what any individual Muslim's attitude is. Historically, you erect mosques um, as, a, as a sign, as a symbol of Islamic power. Um, you see what we just did. Um, so, yeah. All right. Take a big round of applause. Very good. And I'm sure most or all of you have a lot more questions, and the big suggestion I have for you is to invite David to speak at your church or your school or your parachurch group. And uh, th this was a free luncheon, and you were invited as my guests, but what I have been typically doing is leaving it up to your own conscience if you'd like to give a gift to David. Right there, very appropriately, on the little bar there, there's a giant bowl. 
giant metal bowl. I have to. If you would like to give uh, David a gift, if you're making it a check, make it at the David Wood. That's entirely. I live in yeah, I live in New York. I guess you're saying. But I have a couple of announcements also. Sure. First of all, I'd like to introduce to you Pastor Joshua Ayella from.